obviously a lot happening in the news this week regarding Russia yeah. and Ukraine. Um, of course, just just I think within the last 48 hours, uh, Putin accuses the U.S. of trying to drag Russia into uh, a, a war. Uh, and of course, we just saw that the, the U.S. has now deployed uh, troops not to the Ukraine, but to Eastern Europe um, as NATO reinforcements. So I, I think just to start, can you just briefly lay out um, what kind of got us to this present conflict and why particularly right now things seem to be reaching this boiling point? Mm -hmm. Sure, no problem. I mean, I think one thing that it's good to bear in mind in the background of all of this is that in eastern Ukraine itself, there has been a conflict simmering since 2014, uh, since uh, Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula, and then there was this kind of uh, separatist conflict in two provinces of eastern Ukraine, and that conflict has still been simmering there since 2014, pretty much continuously and still taking casualties. So a lot of this geopolitical wrangling that is happening over the heads of what is happening uh, to people in Eastern Ukraine needs to be thought about. Um, in terms of tensions between Russia and the US, um, Russia has been obviously thinking about the US exit from Afghanistan and looking at that and thinking this is a moment to try and redefine the security relationship with the US. So I think a lot of what is going on is Russia kind of seizing a moment when it thinks the West is slightly on the back foot to kind of renegotiate its relationship with NATO, which is mm. You know, it's been a consistent problem for the past, uh, I mean, really since the end of the Cold War, and we can get into the details of that a bit more mm -hmm. later. But so what we've got is Russia seizing this moment to try and force a new set of arrangements. Um, and what has happened is that the West has really upped the tension rather than stepping back and negotiating. So that's why we see these additional arms shipments to Ukraine, uh, additional uh, arrival of troops from the US, and then you get, you know, the British Prime Minister flying into Kiev and saying that, a Russian invasion is imminent. And now, just now today, I think, or yesterday, the Biden administration has started to also step back a little from that idea of an imminent Russian invasion. Mm -hmm. I think we saw Jen Psaki saying, oh, I only use the word imminent once and I'm now not going to use it. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because the Ukrainians are saying, wait a minute, please don't tell everyone World War Three is going to start in our country. So there's a sort of weird disjuncture between this extremely high level of tension according to the US media and that we're seeing mm. in our reporting that those of us in the US and UK consume. Um, but in Ukraine itself, they don't really think this is going to be a war and they would rather it wasn't depicted in that way and they don't really think it's imminent. So there's some something sort of amiss there that a lot of people seem to be assuming there isn't going to be no war, whereas from the Western media, we'd be thinking, you know, World War Three is imminent. And I think we may be just in the next few days seeing the reporting and and the us diplomacy try and find different ways of stepping back from that brink um unless we are going to see a dramatic escalation which we can get into that as well i think that's not likely but i wouldn't totally rule that out unfortunately i want to stay on the subject of kind of liberal or mainstream media misconceptions because um you know, as you pointed out, there's 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 been a lot of chatter. And um, I, I think one popular narrative that I've seen a lot is that the sort of mounting tensions between Russia and Ukraine are almost exclusively a product of Putin's particular brand of just like over the top authoritarian megalomania. And we actually have a clip from a video explainer that I think captures this sentiment quite well. Uh, this this is an explainer that uh, our producer Kale found that has something like over 2.5 million views. So let's take a look. Putin has constructed his own reality here, one in which Ukraine is actually being controlled by shadowy Western forces who are holding the people of Ukraine hostage. And if that he invades, it'll be a swift victory because Ukrainians will accept him with open arms, the great liberator. Like this guy's a total romantic. He's a history buff and a romantic, and he has a hill to die on here and it is liberating the people who have been taken from the Russian motherland. Kind of like the abusive boyfriend who's like, she actually really loves me, but it's her annoying friends who are planting all these ideas in her head. That's why she broke up with me. And it's like, no, dude, that she's, she's over you. All right, so Putin as the abusive boyfriend, um, is this an adequate framework for understanding what's happening? Or um, maybe a better way of putting the question is, how, how, can we, how should we actually think about the conflict and specifically Putin's role within it? Yeah, I think, I mean, so yeah, quick answer, no, that's useless <laughs> uh, and insane and silly. Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things here that I would pick out. One is that um, 
there is this tendency relentlessly in Western coverage to psychologize Russia and psychologize Putin. And so to make this all about his personal motivations, what does he want? What does he think? What are his emotional responses about this or that historical event or whatever geopolitical situation? And I mean, the grain of truth in that is that Russia is, it is a very centralized system and it is a very personalized mechanism of power that has been built around Putin. So the person at the center of that, yes, the personality is important. Um, but if anything, actually, I think a lot of those psychological indicators point in the opposite direction. He's extremely cautious, Putin, mm. prone to then suddenly quite risky behavior out of the blue. But generally speaking, he's quite cautious and calculating. Um, and he's also, so far as we've seen, um, what I would call a legitimist, like he always needs a good legal justification for the thing he is going to do, even if it is actually an aggressive act, um, like the seizure of Crimea, he had a kind of scrupulously worked out justification of that, that he rolled out to the Russian people in advance and then did it. Um, and similarly, with the extension of his presidential term, he was very scrupulous about getting that through, you know, constitutional amendments. He didn't just say, hell with it, I want to stay, right? So I think in terms of the psychology, he is not <laughs> the abusive boyfriend. He is a canny politician, right? who is not responsive to whatever corporate interests or whatever crazy backers that, you know, we have in our wonderful democracies in the West. So he is responsive to different interests. Um, so the psychology does matter to some degree. However, however, what really matters a lot more is the geopolitical context and actually a good, um, friend of mine and colleague who writes very knowledgeably about Russia, Keith Gessen, put this very well. He wrote a good op-ed several years ago called, What Would a Good Putin Do? So imagine mm -hmm. you could take away all of the mean Putin attributes, like make him a really nice person who was really you know, pro-Western. What would that person in charge of this exact country have done in the same period? And the point is that you know it's a useful kind of popular way of thinking about this idea that actually this is a country that has a set of interests that any given leader will try and defend. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, we can get into the history of that if, if there's time, if we want to, but I think after the end of the Cold War, a lot of Western establishments, foreign policy thinkers and leaderships got very used to the idea of a Russia that didn't have interests of its own separate mm -hmm. from those of the West, right? Mm -hmm. They thought, oh, well, Russia's West, they're just our interests and they'll do what we say because obviously we've got the right idea and they want to belong in whatever we're doing. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, that's just patently false. Russia does have its own interests. It took a while for Russia to work out what they were. But once it did, they were not uh, consonant with the interests of the West. And in fact, they were conflicting. And so my way of reading, I mean, and the current Ukraine crisis needs to really be seen in this longer framework that ever since the mid 2000s, really, we're talking from at least 2007 onwards, 2008, the, the, the time when there was the war between Russia and Georgia. Uh, really from then on, what we're seeing is a gradually mounting series of conflicts between Russia and the West because these interests are actually opposed. And I don't think that has much to do with Putin himself, personally. Mm -hmm. I actually want to follow that up with a quote from your book, Russia Without Putin, mm. Putin um, which I, I think this is a really interesting quote. So you write, for much of the post-Soviet era, the Russian elite, Putin very much included, were committed to an ideal of alliance or even integration with the West. Over time, however, it became increasingly clear that this was a one-sided fantasy and Russia's elite gradually abandoned it, swapping dreams of integration for a more strident defense of Russian interests. So as you were saying, um, and I, I think that this is really interesting because it kind of goes against the grain of like the popular or the mainstream conception of Russia as like this existential enemy of the US. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk about this quote a little like, like explain mm -hmm. what you mean here. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a thing that is often forgotten. But obviously, because Putin has been around for so long, and he is this dominant figure, but he has been around through a lot of changes in Russia and in Russia's attitudes to the West. And, and so for example, when Putin became Prime Minister of Russia in uh, 1999, uh, Bill Clinton was still President of the US. Um, in early 2000, uh, Putin became President of Russia at that point, and Clinton was on a visit to Russia, I think, um, on his way out as President, of course. And at that moment, in the year 2000, Putin asked if Russia could join NATO. Okay, and so at that point, Putin, as the representative of the Russian state, thought, yes, we'll join NATO, that's a good idea. Um, and that uh, 
Clinton, I believe at that point, I mean, there's various verbatim records given by diplomats, but no official source for this. But supposedly Clinton said that he personally would not be against it, but personally didn't mean anything for an outgoing US president, right? And mm -hmm. so since then, that is a wish that has not come true. But I think the, the the thing sort of behind that to think about is, what is it that the Russian state wants to do? And in 1999, 2000, it looked rational to, for them to join NATO. Over mm -hmm. time, they realized actually, belonging to NATO, that's not going to work. They're not going to welcome us in. They don't want us in there because having Russia in NATO destabilizes the whole alliance. It doesn't, Russia's too big. It has too much weight militarily. There's all kinds of reasons why it wouldn't fit. And I think they realized, oh, that, that whole idea was a delusion. A delusion encouraged, one should say, by Western powers in the 1990s who gave Russia this whole parallel track, right? They said, yes, let's, let's have ongoing conversations about security. Um, and I think the other thing to think about here is the Russians are very aware of this history. So Putin, you know, he's not just rattling a saber and saying, I want to invade, I want to invade like the abusive boyfriend. He's actually saying, look, we talked about X in 2006. We talked about Y in 2010 at a conference of the OSCE in Astana in Kazakhstan. And we made these agreements to talk about these things and let's talk about them again. I mean, and again, this is not to paint him as some sort of extremely reasonable person. It's not a positive assessment I'm giving. It's more just that the Russians have a kind of clear idea of what the history is that they're reacting to. Um, that is really for them a story of disappointment. So it's mm -hmm. not a history of permanent animosity so much as one of they've been disappointed by how things have gone. Um, and so they now want to reshape the story, basically. I want to step backward just a little bit uh, to talk about NATO, because I, I think in many ways it kind of seems like this mysterious Cold War, Cold War holdover, right? Um, but obviously, uh, as you just alluded to, it is sort of this central player, especially as we're seeing now in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. So, like, what exactly is NATO and why has there been this, like, ongoing push to expand NATO since the 90s? It's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, the origins of NATO that comes out of the aftermath of World War Two and is very much a Cold War formation, right? It's designed to extend the US uh, security umbrella, right, over Western Europe at the time. Um, and to sort of forge that alliance against the Soviet Union and its satellite states in Eastern Europe. And it's very clearly a military alliance formed for the purpose of opposing the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, once the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, there is a question of what is NATO for? If it the, the object it was designed to face off against doesn't exist, what is it for? And at that point, there are a lot of people, including actually conservative figures in the US foreign policy establishment. So it was not a kind of uh, a, a progressive cause per se, actually. A lot of people said, well, great. Now we've won the Cold War, as they thought. Uh, well, let's just disband NATO. There's no point in it anymore. Um, but instead, what happened was NATO actually expanded eastward. Mm -hmm. Because I think for a lot of people, this was an opportunity too good to miss that they thought, and actually it's revealing going back over this history as I did for, for writing my book, that actually there mm -hmm. were people who thought Russia is down and out seemingly for now, but it'll be back eventually. And we will need to have uh, shored up our defenses again by the time that happens. So while Russia is weak, definitely let's expand NATO. Definitely don't get rid of it. Let's push, push, push eastward. So at that point, what you have is NATO uh, expanding eastward. And in fact, you know, it's a sort of interesting feature of European history that NATO expands eastward and the EU follows, right? That first you get the military alliance lined up, and then after that comes the uh, the European sort of economic community, the uh, all of the EU kind of uh, legislative and kind of regulatory architecture and the economy and all of this stuff. Um, yeah, so, so essentially at this point, Russia is just watching this expansion of NATO creeping towards its borders. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like it. But again, the story of the past 30 years has been that Russia is really not in a position to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so one can see a lot of the uh, apparent aggression of Russia's moves, such as like, you know, moving all these troops to the Ukrainian border. That's sort of what they have in their arsenal in terms of getting the attention of the West and trying to persuade the rest excuse me, persuade the West to stop what it's doing, mm -hmm. right? That's that's right. what they've got, because diplomacy has not worked. So um, I think this will be our last question for you, and it kind of mm. goes back to something that you hinted at when you answered the first question. But I, I wonder, do, do you see that, do you see a peaceful way that this conflict can be resolved? And specifically, you know, for the citizens of Russia, Ukraine, and like 
other countries in Eastern Europe and in the US, what is the most ideal outcome? Like putting aside Putin mm -hmm. and other, you know, heads of state for average citizens, what is the ideal outcome? Yeah, this is a tricky one because I think in a way the events of the past several years have actually made the ideal outcome very difficult, if not impossible. Um, I yeah. think many, many years ago, certainly before the annexation of Crimea, what a lot of people were talking about is a neutrality agreement. So make Ukraine officially neutral. Um, and this is what happened during the Cold War, for example, with Austria. And I believe Austria is still not part of NATO. It's like slap bang in the middle of Europe. But at the mm -hmm. time, it was right up against the Iron Curtain. And the idea was have those states be neutral as a kind of buffer zone. That would have been a good idea for Ukraine, I think. But the problem with uh, Putin annexing Crimea and putting all these troops there is that now there are majorities in Ukraine in favor of joining NATO because they definitely think they need that. So I think the the difficulty is there's an, it's hard to see realistically what are the options on the table from any of the players that will allow a climb down. And that's why I think, yeah. even though I don't think anyone it's in anyone's interest to escalate this and have a real war, all of the players have kind of cornered themselves. They haven't really got a good way to climb down. I think Putin needs something he can go home with and say, see, we've got the West's agreement to stall on NATO expansion. And that, if he can dress it up as a victory, he'll withdraw the troops and that will be fine. But if the Biden administration keeps actually, you know, foot on the pedal and increases arms shipments and ups the rhetoric, then that pushes Putin to actually try and do something militarily. So I think it's going to be very hard to de-escalate but some kind of diplomatic solution will have to be fudged out of this somehow. All right. So again, Tony Wood is the author of Russia Without Putin, Money, Power, and the Myths of the New Cold War, and also Chechnya, The Case for Independence. Tony, thank you so much for your time. Good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.